troops of the Third Reich fought all over Europe, North Africa, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Middle East during the Second World War. They earned a formidable reputation as being professional and proficient soldiers regardless of reasons why they fought. Here we look at four soldiers who fought under the swastika and whose combat effectiveness earned them the begrudging respect and of course fear of the enemies they faced. These are four of the deadliest German soldiers of World War II. The war on land was arguably shaped by the armored units of both the Axis and the Allies, having tank superiority either because of superior vehicles, tactics, or sheer weight of numbers was often the deciding factor in many an engagement. Like in all areas of the German war machine, Nazi German culture looked to heroes to admire and inspire others, but in the case of Germany's armored units, one man stood head and shoulders above all the others, but he was overlooked because he didn't fit the image the leadership wanted to portray. Kurt Nispel wasn't born in Germany, but instead born in the Sudenland, an area neighboring Czechoslovakia comprised largely of ethnic Germans that was formerly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and which was ceded to the new Czechoslovak nation after the end of World War I. After the Nazis came to power in Germany, the Sudenland was one of a number of territories that they set their sights upon seizing, or reclaiming from their perspective, an objective they achieved in 1938. Nisbol was born in Silozov near the town of Zygmental and trained as a mechanic until 1940, with Germany having captured Poland and now preparing for the war with France and Great Britain. He volunteered for military service and was assigned to Germany's prestigious armored corps. Training on obsolete Panzer I and Panzer IIs, he eventually qualified as a loader on a Panzer IV, at the time one of the finest armored fighting vehicles in the world, before qualifying to be a gunner. His skill was quickly demonstrated as the German army went into action against the Soviets during Operation Barbarossa in 1941. Hollywood movies about the war are often awash with larger-than-life characters who buck the military trend and toss out the rulebook to achieve victory. That description could very easily be applied to Nispel. He frequently found himself at loggerheads with his commanding officers, with his often unkept appearance and his insistence on growing a small goatee beard and non-regulation length hair which flew in the face of the smartly turned out, well-shaven German soldier of the Nazi propaganda. Possibly the most serious act of insubordination committed by Nispel was when he saw a Waffen-SS soldier beating a Soviet prisoner of war. Nispel intervened and punched the SS man in the face, an act which risked Nispel being accused of treason, punishable by death. However, his skill on the battlefield saved him from such retribution, but at the cost of his progression through the ranks. He would never become an officer, and there was some reluctance to adorn him with some of Germany's more prestigious medals. Nevertheless, he continued to rack up an incredible tally of enemy tanks destroyed, and was decorated several times for his courage. In one stunning engagement, he destroyed a Soviet T-34 tank at a range of 3 kilometers. An incredible feat for the day. He was also supremely confident of his skill, and on several occasions used the formidable Tiger tank to hold off superior enemy numbers sometimes single-handedly, to allow friendly tanks to escape as the war turned against Nazi Germany. In the final days of the war, he commanded the powerful Tiger II, also known as the King Tiger, a true Goliath of the Second World War, but not even this incredible machine could save Germany from its fate. Just ten days before the end of the war, he and his crew were in action against Soviet forces near the village of Wostitz when he was fatally wounded on April 28, 1945. His final official tally was 168 Allied tanks destroyed. However, those who served with him dispute this number, saying that he would regularly give credit for his victories to his subordinates to boost their confidence and morale, meaning his real number is likely much higher. The First World War gave rise to a new kind of hero, the fighter pilot and the greatest of them all was German Manfred von Richthofen. Remembered as the Red Baron, Richthofen scored an impressive 80 aerial victories in combat and earned himself a degree of immortality in the annals of history. However, in the Second World War, several German pilots would surpass his score, although arguably not his fame, while one German Luftwaffe pilot 
would achieve the highest number of air-to-air -air victories in the history of air warfare. His name, Eric Hartman. Born on April 19, 1922, Hartman spent much of his youth in China, as his father sought work there during the post-war economic hardship faced by Germany. When the German Air Force was reconstituted, he was taught to fly gliders by his mother, Elizabeth Hartman, who was one of the first female glider pilots in Germany. He began his formal military career in October 1940, and one of his first official tasks was to ferry Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers to the front lines in the Soviet Union. Once at the front, he flew the legendary Messerschmitt BF-109 fighter plane with, with the veteran JG-52 unit, many of whose members had experienced combat against the Polish, French, and British in the first two years of the war. They impressed their experience on Hartman, who began to apply their knowledge with great efficiency and ruthlessness in the air against the Soviet Air Force. His score very quickly skyrocketed, surpassing many of the older members of his unit. Between his first air combat on October 14, 1942, and September 20, 1943, he had downed a hundred Soviet planes. He had gained such a reputation not just within his own unit, but amongst the Soviets themselves that a reward of 10,000 rubles was posted for anyone who killed him. His war experience was not without its fair share of close calls, however. On the contrary, Hartman would find himself being forced to crash land his aircraft 16 times, often due to damage he had sustained, often from pieces falling off enemy aircrafts he had just destroyed. On one occasion, he was actually captured by Soviet soldiers, but faked an injury, leading his captors to put him on a stretcher and then loading him onto a truck. Biding his time, he waited for an opportunity to present itself before he escaped and made it back to German lines. Hartmann's kills continued, passing over 200 on February 26, 1944, leading some in the German high command to suspect he was either deliberately or unintentionally exaggerating his claims, but repeated investigations only supported his success rates. By the time the war ended, Eric Hartmann had 352 aerial victories to his credit, all but two of which were Soviet planes. The only exceptions were two American fighters shot down on separate occasions. By contrast, the highest scoring Allied pilot was Soviet pilot Ivan Kazedub with 66 victories. After the war, he was tried for war crimes by the Soviet Union who accused him of being part of a flight of German planes that machine gunned a bread factory, killing 780 Soviet civilians. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but was released in 1955 before joining the newly created West German Air Force flying American-designed jet fighters. One such fighter was the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. Despite its blistering speed, Hartman openly criticized the plane as a death trap for pilots, noting his high accident rate. This brought him into conflict with his superiors, and he was forced to take an early retirement in 1970. Hartman died on September 20th, 1993. Three years later, a Russian court issued him with a posthumous acquittal regarding his supposed war crime stating that he was wrongly convicted. Throughout the history of warfare, there have been those with an almost unnatural gift for destroying the enemy, and one such individual was Mathis Hatzenauer. Like Nipsel, while he fought for Nazi Germany, he was actually born elsewhere specifically Austria, which was absorbed into Germany during the Anschluss of 1938. Born on December 23, 1924, in the Italic Alpine village of Brixen am Thal, he learned his shooting skills from his father, as the poor family regularly had to live off the land. At age 17, he was drafted into the German army as the fighting on the Eastern Front broke out. Heitzenauer was assigned to train to use artillery and mortar weapons, but his superiors noticed that he had exceptional rifle skills, and this led him to being transferred to a sniper unit. In this new role, Heitzenauer went into combat in Hungary from August 1944, where his role was to hunt down Soviet snipers and take out key Soviet officers and commanders who hampered their ability to function properly. It was exceptionally dangerous work as he often had to sneak behind enemy lines to reach his target, and all the while he had to contend with the equally proficient Soviet snipers who were hunting him. Joining the battlefield so late in the war, Heitzenauer would see combat for just 10 months before Germany surrendered but this makes his final tally of 345 kills all the more astonishing. One of his most famous shots saw him take out a Soviet soldier at a range in the region of 1,100 yards or 10 American football fields. Heitzenauer survived the war, but like Hartman in the air, the Soviets wanted him to pay for his proficiency and he was kept in prison in appalling conditions along with other German prisoners until 1950. After his release, he returned to Austria where he retrained as a carpenter. 
He died in 2004 at the age of 79. Wartime British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, when reflecting upon the war, would state categorically that the one thing that genuinely frightened him during those dark days were the U-boats. Germany's underwater warships appeared unstoppable during the opening months of the war as they took full advantage of how unprepared Britain was for being besieged by these stealthy, lethal weapons. You might expect the success of the U-boat commanders being measured by the number of enemy ships they sank, however, this is not the case. Instead. U-boat commanders measured their success in tonnage sank, and to that end, despite having a relatively short war, U-boat commander Otto Kreschmer would be responsible for sinking more tonnage than any other commander. Kreschmer was born in Prussian Silesia on May 1, 1912, during the days of Imperial Germany before the area was ceded to Poland after the First World War. Prior to joining the post-war German Navy, which was forbidden from possessing a submarine fleet, he studied English and literature at Exeter University in England for eight months. By 1936, Nazi Germany was again actively building up the country's U-boat fleet and Kretschmer was transferred to the new force. After completing his training, he found himself assigned to the U-35, an early type VIIA U-boat. During a training cruise, Kretschmer had the misfortune of being on deck when the captain decided to dive the submarine, leaving him floating in the freezing North Sea waters. It was only when the captain realized he was missing that he resurfaced and brought him back aboard before he succumbed to hyperthermia. In 1937, as Germany became entwined in the Spanish Civil War, Kretschmer found himself placed in temporary command of U-35 while waiting for the U-boat's new captain to arrive. He never would, for he was killed in a car accident, and Kretschmer became captain. His first assignment was to patrol the Bay of Biscay as part of Germany's contribution to fighting, but no ships were sunk. By the time World War II started in September 1939, Kretschmer had transferred to U-23 and was assigned to patrol the North Sea and the British coastline. On October 4, 1939, Kretschmer in U-23 sank the 876-ton merchant vessel Glenfarg off Scotland's northern coastline. Kretschmer allowed the crew to abandon the ship before he sunk it with a G-7A torpedo. Almost two months later, he sank the 2,400-ton Danish ship Skoshia, and then a month after that, he sank the 1,150 Norwegian ship Fredville. In the early hours of February 18, 1940, he torpedoed the British destroyer HMS Daring, which brought his total tonnage up to that point of 16,343 tons. On April 18, 1940, he assumed command of the newly commissioned Type VIIB U-boat, U-99. But while working his new command up to being combat ready, the sub was attacked at sea four times in a week by German aircrafts, the pilots of which mistook it for a British submarine. Kreschmer and the U-99 achieved their first kill on July 5, 1940, sinking the 2,000-ton Canadian merchant ship Magog, which had become separated from its convoy south of Ireland. In terms of tonnage sunk, Kreschmer's tally would get a major boost when he sunk three British armed merchant cruisers over the span of a month in late 1940. First was the 18,724-ton HMS Laurentic on November 3rd, followed by the 11,314-ton HMS Patroclus the very next day before he added the 16,402-ton HMS Forfar on December 2nd. Into 1941, more and more ships would be added to his list of successes. His single biggest success was the 20,638-ton Terzeviken sunk southeast of Iceland on March 7th, 1941. Then, over a week and a half later, on March 16, 1941, Kretschmer spotted convoy HX-112 and began a series of devastating attacks. He would send six ships from the convoy to the bottom of the sea, totaling 43,819 tons in just a single day, but during repeated depth charge attacks by the convoy's escorts, U-99 was damaged to the point where it sank below its crush depth. Incredibly, the submarine held its structural integrity long enough for Kreschmer's crew to effect repairs to bring the submarine back to the surface. With British warships bearing down on the submarine looking for revenge, Kreschmer decided to order his crew to abandon U-99 and Scuttler. Kreschmer and all but three of his crew were rescued by the British ships and taken prisoner. After arriving in Liverpool, Kreschmer was separated from his men who were forced to march through the city where they were the subject of a number of bricks and other objects being hurled at them by the angry Liverpudlians who had suffered terrible German bombings in the weeks before. Kreschmer was taken to the so-called London Cage, where British intelligence interrogated valuable German prisoners. 
He would later confess that during the journey, he passed by bomb sites in the British capital, including the Buckingham Palace, and was appalled at what his countrymen had done to the city. He would spend nearly seven years as a prisoner of war, being held first in Cumbria and then later at a camp in Canada. For his recognition of war service, during his time in captivity, the German Navy formally promoted him. After the war, he had a long and prestigious career in the West German Navy before retiring in September 1970. It is with some irony that a man who had sent so many ships to the bottom of the sea should die in a boating accident while on holiday after he fell trying to climb a vertical ladder.